So hello everyone and many thanks for joining us in this webinar focusing on action research. Uh, in this webinar we will learn um, how to examine our educational practice systematically and carefully using the techniques of research and we will discuss about how we can turn a neat winning project into a classroom based investigation that could help inform our future teaching practices. Uh, to discuss all this, we are glad to have with us uh, Myrin Glenn, who's an independent advisor on postgraduate teacher education programs in the Network of Ed for Educational Action Research in Ireland. Uh, Myrin is a formerly primary school teacher and school principal, action research practitioner and co-author of bo four books. Uh, Myrin, many thanks for joining us today. The floor is yours. Great. OK, hi, everybody. I'm just uploading my slides here. Um, so uh, my name is Maureen Glenn, as Effie just had said, and I'm delighted to meet you all. And I'm also equally delighted uh, to be at this session today. Um, it's very exciting to meet people from all over Europe, all over the world sometimes, who are interested um, in doing um, action research and who are interested in e-twinning, which are both really good projects. So um, I'm going to give you the opportunity at the end of this session to ask questions um, and feel free to have, you know, to input any queries you might have in the chat section um, right throughout the session, because I'm sure I'm going to say things that you will probably say to yourselves, oh my goodness, what is this woman talking about? So please put your questions in the chat and we will address them at the end. Or if there's something really urgent, Effie is going to alert me in the middle and just you we might uh, have a chat about stuff. Um, I'm also going to use Menti in this session, so you might find it easier to use your phone for that. Um, if you're not using it already, OK, um, it, you know, and if you happen to fall out of the session, just follow the link that brought you here already. OK. So I'm going to talk about educational action research. So it's a, um, it's a values based form of research that can be undertaken in your practice with the aim of enhancing it, improving it, and at the same time, working towards a better, more just and more equitable world as we try to make a difference. So as teachers and researchers, we hope to act educationally. Um, in the sense of acting for the good of each person and for the good of humankind, that's what Stephen Chemist says. So while undertaking educational action research, the researcher generates their own educational theory um, from their practice. Um, OK, so the key features. So the research is about yourself and your work along with others. OK, so you, the research is on you. OK, so you'll be asking, how can I improve my practice? But it's not just you on your own in isolation. It's you and your class or perhaps you and your colleagues at school or perhaps the parents or the wider community. And this is one of the big differences between traditional forms of action, of research and action research. Um, we, as action researchers, place ourselves right at the heart of the research with the aim of enhancing our practice. So it's also values based and a values led form of research. So our values lie at the heart of the whole process. So we base, as educators, we know this, we base our practice on the values we hold. They're the foundations of our work. And they're also the overarching principles towards which we aspire. Some people like to use the term axiology to describe the way we bring our values right into the research process. Now, in many forms of traditional research, values are expected to be kept right side, outside of the research in a detached, impersonal kind of way. But for those of us involved in action research and self-study, they are included and they lie right at the heart of the research. So examples of values might be social justice, care, equality, inclusion. These are often the values that people say they hold when they're involved in, in action research. So reflection is built into the action research process, you know, where you're as, as an action researcher, you actively take time out. To reflect on your day's work, to reflect on the positive experiences as well as the issues of concern that arise for you. 
Action researchers record the reflection in a reflect in a research journal. So you always see action researchers going around with notebooks um, and they're always writing down ideas right throughout the day and then they reflect, you know, in a calmer time in the evening. We also reflect critically. And by critically, I mean, we question, we question the taken for granted assumptions we make about our practice. We draw up a research question. And of course, our question has to do with aiming towards enhancing or perhaps exploring a particular aspect of practice, of our practice. And when I say our practice, I mean, as teachers of our teaching, and our questions generally are kind of of the form, how do I learn more about my teaching of maths, for example? So action research, the name gives it away, really. It involves taking action as well, too, um, and maybe modifying the action if necessary. Um, and also new learning emerges in the process of the learning. Um, so by the action, you know, when we take an action, maybe it's introducing a new activity in our classroom or perhaps it's exploring a practice we already are doing and it's about generating new learning and like all forms of research it assumes rigor and data collection seeking ethical permissions uh, reading about our area of interest analyzing data stating new learning generating theory and sharing our new learning with others it is a cyclical process um, in that usually we do one cycle of action research and then from the learning that has emerged in that cycle, we move on and do another cycle. And sometimes I may as well warn you, it becomes a lifelong habit. So be ready for it. Um, action research is for everybody. It is for everybody. Um, you know, we tend to think about research only being for academics, but it is for everybody and it takes place in your workplace and you. The truth and tell the truth of your given situation, regardless of how imperfect or flawed it might be. So research is always, as I've said, along with others, pupils, colleagues, critical friends, parents, the wider community, even maybe perhaps e-twinning partners. OK, so I, I've said already that I lies at the heart of the research. I, I mean me. So in educational action research, you put yourself at this as the researcher and as the educator or the, the practitioner at the centre of the research. So once you begin to do action research in your practice, you're both a practitioner and a researcher. And it's quite a complex and complicated role, really. But it's good fun. So you ask questions, as I've just said, with an eye focus. Um, and you become empowered to enhance your practice. And that's something that's not really been, um, I suppose, researched or documented well, but it's true. When you talk to other action researchers, they feel a sense of taking control and being empowered and being able to change things for the better, which is good, I think, in our, person, in, in our, our current climate of being told and being prescribed what to do. Um, I think it's a good thing for us as teachers and educators to feel about our work. Um, the I in educational research, as I've already said, is not egotistical. Um, it is, you know, it is a kind of a broad, outward looking I. Um, and Jack Whitehead has a nice clip there on YouTube and you can check it out yourselves later where he talks about that whole idea. Um, I'm not going to show it to you now, but you can catch it yourselves um, later on. OK, so why would we do action research? Well, I suppose the main thing is it's transformative. You know, it's about change. You know, you take steps to enhance your practice or about learning more about it. It's based on real life on the real everyday occurrences that happen in your classrooms and your places of work and the unpredictability of school life. And so even in COVID times, it was a good piece of research to do because it embraced all the upset and all the discomfort that people experienced while during COVID. Even at a basic level, taking steps to improve practice is beneficial. 
you know, you share your research in terms of your educational influence, not only on yourself and your learning, but on the learning of others and potentially on policy, perhaps. We also um, explore our own identity and we'll delve into that a little in a little while. Um, but we get to know ourselves a little bit more as people and as professionals. Um, and we as we, you know, come to terms and explore, I suppose, our understandings of our values and how they inspire how we work, at least how they're meant to inspire how we work. Um, and again, I have that whole idea of the sense of ownership and agency and how action researchers really do tend to be collegiate and supportive of one another. Action researchers always, you know, if, you, if an action researcher looks for help from something, then somebody will always come to their aid and offer some form of help if needed. Um, it just seems to go with the territory. I'm not sure. Again, it's not a researched fact, but it does seem to be the case. OK, so looking at a research project, there were kind of three main stages, and I suppose that they're pretty clear, uh, you know, and they align with many other forms of research. There's the preparation stage, which I think in, a, in action research is really, really important. You know, and I'd nearly say to people, you know, try and do the preparation stage before you begin the action research, which I guess is maybe a bit, a bit of a complication. Um, but the preparation stage is really important to put the, you know, all the work in before you actually do the project. Then the project stage is the second stage and the theory stage, generating our theory from our practice is the final stage. Um, and I just run through these three stages briefly. OK, so the preparation stage. Is I suppose it begins off with that whole idea of stopping and reflecting. So the initial stage of action research and of self study and of, you know, all good forms of research really is that whole idea of just stopping. Taking a breath and taking time to just have a think about the work we do as teachers. OK, to question what it is that we do and why we do what we do. To talk to critical friends. Now, I've said the word critical friends already, and I'm just going to explain what a critical friend is here. A critical friend is a kind of a key person in your action research process. The critical friend is somebody you turn to right throughout the research process and you share the ideas that are coming to you with them. Usually people can have two or three critical friends and your friend is there to support you and to encourage you um, and to try and keep you on track. But above all else, um, that they would question um, any ideas you have that they may not necessarily think are clear or fair or proper. So a critical friend kind of they have a tough love situation going on with you in that they want to be there for you to support you, but that they will question um, anything that needs to be questioned. OK, so that's your critical friend. So it's always good to have at least one, if not a few, maybe somebody who's familiar with your work. You know, maybe it might be a co-teacher or it might be somebody, a teacher in another school or it ne need necessarily be a teacher, but somebody who understands what you're working at. Um, OK, preparation. So we need to, you know, work on our thinking and our reading. Um, and if we haven't begun to read, professionally about our work, maybe now is a good time to start to do it. Think about our identity and ourselves and our values and our sense of being a professional. So we ask ourselves questions like what are my concerns and why am I concerned, um, as outlined by Jean McNiff and Jack Whitehead. Um, and I will discuss those ideas in a few minutes in greater detail. OK, it's good to establish a re research question as is the case with all um, forms of research. It's with, with us action researchers, we try to imagine possibilities and what we would like for our practice. And then we decide on a plan of action. And the action needn't necessarily be an intervention. The action can be developing a new insight ourselves into our work. It's up to ourselves to mold the project into our own needs and our own set of values. So we make a timeline for the project and we think about how we might collect data to show that we are learning and that there is something happening in our research. 
Um, and it's important, of course, to get all necessary ethical permissions and approval before we start doing anything like that. The project stage then is the second stage, and this is where we begin to implement the new strategy, the new form of thinking, the new attitude, whatever it is that we're trying that we're going to change. Um, so we gather data and reflect on the work that we're doing and we evaluate the actions we're taking um, and we review how we see our values lived in our practice. So we can see immediately that there is that direct connection between enhancing practice and the values we hold and how they're interconnected and they're part perhaps of a bigger worldview. We're looking for indications that we are improving our practice, that we're actually doing what we're saying we're doing. And we don't always find that, you know, um, but we try obviously to do that. And um, we establish great criteria by which you can evaluate the work, the quality of the work. Um, and we discuss the research with critical friends, as I've just said, on an ongoing basis. And we're always looking for evidence to show enhanced practice. That's the main focus of this of the project stage. Then when we move on to generating theory from practice. We make an overall claim and we say, I have learned basically, this is what I have learned in the duration of my project. Now, if you get, as I said a moment ago, if you cannot see an improvement in practice, and sometimes that is the case, despite people's best efforts, things really haven't improved and they have no data to show an improvement. Um, but I do, you know, sometimes people become disheartened when this happens. Um, but there is no need to be disheartened because no matter what happens, you will have learned and increased your professional learning in the process. And that in itself is a valuable, valuable piece of learning um, to be shared with others. Um, obviously, we would like to see an improvement in practice and it's the nature of ourselves as teachers to, to want to see that improvement. But just sometimes it doesn't work out as sweetly as we would like. It's important for us to be rigorous and to show our integrity as practitioners and researchers and to give an honest account of what happens. So that whole idea of generating theory sounds maybe a little bit frightening for people, but really basically what it means, according to McNiff and Whitehead and other writers in the field, it means just giving descriptions and explanations of what you have done. Um, and that is really what it's, that's what we mean by generating theory is making a claim and offering descriptions and explanations. So it's not a very highbrow thing. It just sounds more highbrow than it actually is. OK, it's always good, I think, when we in, when we're engaged in action research. And even if it's only a tiny little project, I think it's good to have a report or a presentation of some kind so that you can share the story of your learning. Um, and very often, maybe we'll only share the story of our learning with our colleagues or our class groupings, you know, or maybe we could go further afield. But it's important to show the potential significance of your work. And then maybe, if you like, move on to a new cycle again. I know Donald Sean talked about how new questions are really important as well. But you may, of course, just be exhausted after one cycle and feel you've done enough. OK, so we're going to look at a model of um, how we might do action research. Now, again, this is a McNiff and Whitehead model, and they have modified this themselves over the years because, as you can see, it's quite old. Um, and I'm sure they probably will continue to do so. Um, so it begins off with you asking yourself, what is my concern or my area of interest? What is, why am I concerned? How do I show the situation as it is and as it develops? And so that's about collecting data. What can I do about it? What is my plan? What will I do? What intervention will I undertake? Or what exercise will I do? What will my action be? How can I test the validity of my claims to knowledge? So how, how can I be sure that what I'm saying is correct? And, you know, our critical friends are very valuable at this stage. You know, when you run ideas by them and they can say, yes, this is what you have done. This is what you've learned. And how do I modify my ideas and practices in the light of the evaluation? So it's those, see those first two questions are the ones we're going to be looking at really. What is my concern and why am I interested or concerned? OK, so McNiff and White had chose to use the words, what is my concern? But I know my colleagues and Neri and I 
have declared that the, that idea of what is my concern can be reinterpreted or rephrased um, as, you know, what am I interested in or what am I passionate about or what am I curious about? What puzzles me, me about my work? What aspect of my practice would I like to explore more fully? Or even what irritates me about my practice? You know, those of you who are involved in e-twinning are obviously, I would say, curious about other cultures and making collaborative projects with other people in other countries and making ideas or understandings of other cultures accessible and interesting, both for your students and yourself. So right now we're just going to take a little moment and I'm going to just move on to our next slide. So I would like you to go to menti.com, if that's possible, and to use the code 28056251. And what we're going to do is, I'm just going to just negotiate back, I'm just, or navigate back, okay? So these are the questions, what am I interested in? And see how many of those answers you can answer as many times as you want and you just see if it can bring yourself to what is important for yourself if you were to undertake an action research project. OK, now I'm going to give you the link here. I know Effie has put it in the chat. I'll leave this here for a moment until we all get established there. OK, so it's 28056251. And these are the questions I'd like you to ask. Um, and so really in tradition, in, OK, and recently we'd just be asking, what is my concern? What is bothering me? Whereas we can look at more positive things as well. So try and fill in there um, as many answers. I'll give you two or three minutes for that, OK? OK, so I hope you've had the opportunity to put in a few answers, at least even one answer to those questions there. What am I interested in? What am I passionate about? As reinterpretations of what is my concern. OK, so I think if you click on the results link here yourselves, it should bring you to um, our results sheet um, and we see how things are going. So we've got answers here. People are interested in exchange, cultural differences, different cultures, curious just in general, the climate crisis, technology, coding robotics technology and emerging technologies. Um, I'm interested in motivating students, practices and teaching. Um, curious about that the young are not as curious about all oh, oh, that they find it that young people are not as curious as um, people might cons might consider. OK, that's interesting. And um, so these are things that might become a focus for the re for a research an action research project. OK, so um, I hope you were able to see those results there. Um, OK. OK, so. Action research and your e-twinning project. OK, so how can we link them? Well, actually, we can link them very easily because nearly by nature, there are elements that just cross over one another um, and make them, I suppose, accessible. So if we think about our possibilities around our e-twinning, and I think maybe just from the answers we've looked at, we can see that there are links already. Um, and just have a little think about how you might do 
some research on your work with e-twinning. Okay, so you are already doing, or at least thinking about doing something innovative. You know, I know some of you are right in the middle of an e-twinning project, whereas others of you are just maybe beginning or dipping your toes in the e-twinning process. But already we know that action research is for any aspect of your if, of your practice. So right now you can begin to think about doing an action research project on your e-twinning process. Do you find that you're already maybe beginning to become a better teacher as a result of your, you know, your e-twinning project? You might even be becoming more insightful. So if you explore your interest in your e-twinning project and ask yourselves questions like, why am I so interested in this particular process and e-twinning itself? E-twinning is a pretty innovative idea. Not every teacher is involved in it. So ask yourself, why? Why am I interested in e-twinning? Or you could ask yourself, why am I interested in the project, the specific project you're doing with your e-twinning partner or partners? What is it that has drawn you to that? You can investigate how your project is going. You can investigate what brought you to the project. You can ask yourself what you are learning from the process. What are your students um, learning? You know, it's an in innovative project that involves collaboration. So what is your experience of collaboration? Are all your students in your class connecting through this e-twinning process? Are you yourself as a practitioner making connections perhaps with your own parents? Are you making connections with the wider community? And are you making connections with the community of your partner school? These are all really intriguing questions and they are very, very valid to do research on both as action researchers and people involved in the e-twinning process. Okay, so we've been looking at doing action research in our own practice. But there is also a possibility, and again, you don't have to do it. You can do the, e, you can do the action research in your own uh, practice as an e-twinning school. But you could also like you could also choose to research collaboratively with your e-twinning partner if you liked. But you would need to think about how you would align your project aims with those of your e-twinning partner and how you, you would align your values with those of your partner schools. That one might be a little bit difficult. Also, you need to ask yourself, how would you respond to people with different values and aims? And how might you include parents and the wider community in this type of a project? But it, I know it has been done and I suppose it will continue to be done. So I'm going to look now for a few minutes at the project. So an action research project on your e-twinning collaboration. So I'm going to look at maybe the steps that you could or the tasks you could consider undertaking as you do this. So again, we're, as we said earlier, the first step is just stopping, pausing and reflecting about your work as a teacher um, and thinking about how you might do some research on your e-twinning project and your e-twinning process in general. So there are two things happening in your e-twinning, or there's many things happening in your e-twinning. There's the whole idea of wanting to reach out to a school in a different culture. But there's also then the project that you do together, you know, and you can combine the two or maybe pick one over the other. It depends. You can pick your own thing that's of the most interest and of the most perhaps even concern for you. It would be important, I think, to tell your e-twinning partner about your research project um, you know, to let them know that you are going to be researching the practice that you're doing um, in the in that process of doing the, the, the project, the e-twinning project. 
Okay, another stage, or at least a beginning step off point would be to develop a heightened sense of awareness around your work in the field of e-twinning. Okay, and just to be, to develop kind of a higher sense of listening and of thinking and of watching and just awareness. And that helps us as we undertake our project. So does your e-twinning work inspire your schoolwork? or that of your students, or indeed that of the wider community. It's a good idea also to develop, to do some professional reading. And I know I've said it earlier, but it is important, even in the area of e-twinning itself or collaborative projects. And of course, yet again, I'm saying yet again, do you know, develop your critical friends. OK, we spoke about values and we kind of left them for a moment. But they are crucial to the whole action research process. Um, so they are they are what they are the underpinning foundations. They're what kind of guide us not only in our research but in our actual teaching, and they're also the overarching principles towards which we aspire. And they also help us to develop the criteria by which we evaluate our research when we go into the more formal technicalities of doing a research project. They feed into the formal validation processes. But for now, and I know some people are really good at thinking immediately what their, um, what their values might be. And for others, it takes a while. In fact, sometimes it takes a whole research process for people even to come to terms around understandings what are the values that inspire us as teachers? What are the values that inspire you as e-twinning teachers, perhaps? So let's take a moment to write into the chat box the values that you think you might hold. We have some in, in, in the picture there, but they needn't be the ones that you use. Inclusion. Yes, it's funny. Some people immediately know what their values are and then others, they find it difficult to kind of think, well, what is it? But you know what? It's an important part of our own um, professionalism to have an awareness of what of what our values are. Connection is a lovely one because it, you know, it obviously speaks to e-twinning identity really good. And that's part of our action research process. Respect. Fabulous. Tolerance. Brilliant democracy and our understandings of democracy from nation to nation vary so widely you know we need to develop an understanding what we mean by democracy collaboration empathy yes very important empowerment and hopefully empowerment is something that will come to us as we do our action research on our on our, on our project caring respect empowerment creativity Collaboration, love, tolerance and respect, empathy. And you know, there was a time like where love wouldn't ever fit into um wouldn't ever fit into an action research project. Whereas now we can say, you know, with our hand her heads held high, that we hold love as a value. And there are many action research projects that I can point you to if you want to, that actually has love as a as a value. That's great. Thank you for sharing those for me. Um, you will find them again, I guess, in our in our final um, video when the time comes. OK. So we need to do a little bit of writing as well, maybe. And I'm, I'm just going to suggest gentle writing, nothing too difficult. Um, but it's important for us to write a reflective journal. Do you remember I said um, at the very beginning that we take time to pause and reflect. So reflection isn't just something that happens as we're driving home from work or as we're doing our shopping or as we're brushing our teeth in the morning, although we do reflect, but the hard work from it actually comes in the writing of a journal. So anybody who's going to do an action research project, you would need to go and get buy yourself a notebook Buy one that you like, maybe buy one that you can bring with you anywhere you want to go. Um, and that whole idea of writing reflectively 
I would say just begin off and just give yourself 10 minutes, 15 minutes of peace in the evening after your day's work and just have a think. Just let your consciousness stream and just write because your journal is for you and for you only. You don't have to use academic language. You don't have to use any of the conventions that we normally enforce on writing. Your journal is for you. And just have a think about your day and about the things that happened that were important for you um, and have a play around with the ideas around maybe your values and try to figure out what your values are and what's happening in your place of work, in your e-twinning project specifically. So you can write as honestly as you want and also perhaps even write critically. You can always um, revisit your reflections and think about them twice or think about them three times. That's called being reflexive and it's well worth doing because you find over time you change um, you change your thinking. OK, so forming a research question, if you're going to go on and do an action research project, it's always a good idea to form a research question. So asking yourself questions like what am I concerned about? What am I interested and curious about like we just did? and asking yourself why this is the case, which we'll do in a few minutes, um, help you to form that research question because you begin to take notice of what is really important for you right now. Um, and obviously we place I, myself, at the heart of the question. Um, I think it's important for you to, you know, when you're thinking about a research project and a research question, that your research focus is small and manageable and doable that you know, you're not trying to change the world with this project. And while your project may begin to do something to change the world, for now, it's good to have it achievable and perhaps maybe not too time consuming, especially for your first, you know, if you're, this, you're, if you're just dipping your toes in the process for the first time. Ensure that your question is also debatable, that it just doesn't have a yes, no type of answer because then there's no, you know, there's no, fruit to be born from doing the project. You try to tie it in with the values you hold. And obviously it should be something to do with your e-twinning project um, because that's why we're all here today. Um, okay, so types of data that we might be able to collect in our action research project. Okay, so I've, I've kind of two columns here. Now, I'm not sure how many of them are suitable for your own workplace, um, but they're worth a try. OK, so way we, ways we can collect data in schools is through conversations, um, which are really important, and observations. So conversations with our students, with our colleagues, with our principals, with whoever, parents, community, our e-twinning partners, the observations we make in the process, artefacts, if we're making things, if students are writing things all these are important photos and videos now I know there are problems sometimes in schools with ethical permissions and stuff so you obviously would need to check that before you you know you take photographs or videos or anything like that copy books exercise books pupils comments parents views colleagues observations interviews questionnaires you can make up a questionnaire to find out the information you're really seeking Pre-tests and post-tests can help and surveys can help as well. So the ones on the left hand side are con considered qualitative forms of data collection and are considered to be qualitative forms of research uh, methods. And the ones on the right are con considered to be quantitative. It's not relevant, but just to highlight it for you. It's not very important, but just to show you what would be involved. One of the main sources of data, I think, is our research journal. OK, um, the research journal is key. So that's why I'm saying go and buy your uh, buy your notebook pretty soon and have it ready and start writing in it immediately. You know what? Even if you never undertake an action research project, getting a reflective journal um, and using it and revisiting your ideas is a really good. It's a good healthy thing to do for yourself even. OK, ongoing tasks for the duration of the research process. 
So once you've begun to address your questions, what am I concerned about and why am I concerned? You're beginning to put in place um, the foundations of your research. So right throughout the research pro project, the interconnection between reading and talking and writing is being emphasized. Um, and hopefully um, that you would see connection between those things um, as you begin to do that kind of more formal part of the research. Um, and it's good, I suppose, to reflect on and to name your values, to read professionally and to talk and to share your ideas with your critical friends or indeed anybody who listen to you or engage in the process. OK, so I'm revisiting now our plan that we did that I showed you. And I said we're focusing on the first two questions. So we did what is my concern or my area of interest or what am I passionate about? I'm now moving on to the second one, which is why am I concerned? Why am I interested? Why am I passionate? And it's something that has to be addressed and it's a difficult, it's a far more difficult question. So be ready for it. Now, again, um, you know, people just find it easy enough to answer what are my concerns, my areas of interest. This one is a different one. It's why am I concerned or why am I interested, passionate and so on. So let's try another mentee. So the code for this mentee is, you can see it there, 5182985. Um, and as I say, it's a more difficult one. Why am I concerned? Now try it. OK, these things are not going to be held up for you to, um, you know, to, to sign off on or anything like that. This is just we're just playing with the ideas, dipping our toe in the water. So try and get your answer in there. Or even to begin to think about it. I'm not expecting really, you know, deep, insightful answers just to, on the hop like this. But it's something you can play with in your notebook once you buy your reflective journal. Marine, are you still here? I think we lost her. Give us one moment and we'll be back. In the meantime, yeah, please feel free to uh, write your comments on the chat. Yes, Marine, you're back. We are muted, Marine. Sorry, I don't know what happened there, but if you no put in your um, yes, so if you put in your stuff there on the chat um, OK, and I'm going to try. I wonder, can I just share? I've only a few minutes left here anyway, so um, if you put in your comments on or even the mentee, actually, I think was the idea. Yeah. Um, OK, sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened with the connection. OK, so um, I'm just going to try and get my slides up again if I can. You know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk through the next at this final section because there's only a minute or two in it and I would be wasting my time looking around for my slides um, on, 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 in the internet. OK, so it's always a good to have, um, it's always a good idea to have um, some form of report when you have done your research process, OK? So we're tying the whole idea of doing the research that's based on our values once we have established what they are and how we'd like to improve our practice. So it's a good idea to try and um, write up some kind of a report or make up some kind of a presentation to show your new learning, to show the theory you've generated um, for others. And so um, like if you need to decide 
what your research report is going to look like or who you're going to share it with. So for many people, they just want to have a chat with their maybe their colleagues and say, this was my learning and my action research project. But for others, they like something a little bit more formal. And so the format of writing a more formal report usually has a couple of elements, like say the abstract, the introduction, the literature review, it shows your reading, the methodology, you've done an action research project, the findings and discussions. What did you learn in terms of improved practice? What did you learn in terms of enhancing uh, your practice? And what did you learn about living more closely to your values? And your conclusion of where you think your research should go from there. And they're the basic elements of um, an action research report of a more formal one. But of course, you needn't do that. But I think no matter what you do, you should decide to try and share your research with others um, when you have it done. So sharing your research with others, you can do it informally um, and you can do it with colleagues in your school or you could maybe write a blog about it or do a podcast, perhaps whatever suits your own um, interests. For formal things, you could consider um, submitting it to an ac academic journal such as EJOLTS or perhaps um, the Action Research Journal or present even your findings at a conference, an education conference. People would be really interested to hear how you did your action research on, um, on an e-twinning project. Okay, my final two slides. So Effie, are the people going to see these slides? I wonder now that I'm not sharing them. We're gonna share the slides too, yes. Brilliant, okay. So I have just two recommended pieces of reading that if you are really interested in this. So your first piece, um, is a fabulous little, it's a, just a little Word document on Jean McNiff's website, and you'll find the link on these final slides when Effie gets to share them. I really recommend it. It's a very readable, encouraging piece. It's just a short little piece. Of, you know, it won't take you 20 minutes, 15 minutes to read it, or less even. Um, and it's in, kind of inspiring and it's encouraging, and it shows how doable an action research project is. And the second one is a, an introduction to critical reflection and action for teachers, which is a book um, that my colleagues and I wrote. And so somebody's asking, can I share the link here? I'm not sure that I can, I'll have a go. Okay, and that was my final thing that I had to say. Um, but so I would like you, if you have any questions or indeed Effie, if you picked up on anything there that uh, people would like to ask, I'd be more than willing to answer questions. I'll try and find those links now, okay? Thanks, uh, Maureen. I haven't seen a specific um, question yet related okay. to your presentation, but I would like to invite participants to share them now or comment on something that they would like to discuss further in the last uh, minutes before we close this webinar. Um, in the meantime, I would like yeah, to thank you very much, uh, Myrene. I think it's uh, very interesting to hear how we can bring these research elements in our practice. Uh, teachers in general, um, they need to be better prepared uh, to, to implement action research in their, own, in their own practices because, yeah, actually they're, they're collecting this kind of results every day. They are in the classrooms, they are testing um, different approaches, different techniques, different activities, methods. So um, if, we, if we just, yeah, just follow the, the main elements of research, this uh, input can provide us uh, yeah, very viable feedback for our practices. So it's, um, it's a very good practice to, to follow uh, if we want to improve in general as uh, practitioners. Yeah, the participants, Marine, also thank you very much for the inspirational presentation. Not sure if you are still here and you hear us. Now I've lost you. Any other questions will, that you would like to ask to the speaker? Please, um, yeah, take some time and write it now in the chat. You're back, Marine. Hi. You're muted again. I don't know what's happening with your connection. I don't know either. Yeah. No worries. No worries. It happens in on, online events, live events. Uh, well, any any final last words from your side? Um, I, I, 
And I don't really, I'm, I'm not sure if that link went in there or not, but and it will be on the slides anyway. Um, but I would really encourage you to do it. I know, OK, so I'm retired from teaching and I didn't get the opportunity to be involved in e-twinning, but I did get involved in Comenius projects and I did huge, really, really good, um, in my own view anyway, really good action research on those projects which were collaborative and which were international and which, you know, explored different cultures using different classroom projects. I would really recommend that you try it. And if I can be of any help to anybody, please just give me a shout, drop me an email. Thank you, Marine. Actually, I see one question here. Uh, one participant says that the twinning projects focus on collaboration and teamwork. However, action research is a bit individual. So what, that, so what are the strategies to draw them together? What's your answer on that? Just say it again. I didn't, I didn't actually get to see it. Where do we see? So, so the participant says that the twinning projects focus on collaboration and teamwork, but the action research is a bit of individual task. So how are these two different? Uh, yeah. Yes. In OK, so my answer to that is yes, action research is about focusing on your practice, but it's your practice in the teamwork, in the collaboration with others, in the connections you're making throughout your e-twinning. Um, and also, if you wish, you could also do a joint action research project with your colleagues in, in your e-twinning circle as well, if you like. But I would recommend if you're new to it, it's good to try it on your own first. But it's never an introverted kind of a thing. It's always looking out. It's about making connections and researching along with your partners and with the children or the students in your class. Um, it's always with others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One more question uh, regarding the permissions uh, in uh, yeah doing research. Uh, do you recommend us to have uh, we have parents' permission when we have a practice that is intended to be used as research, even if it's just an in innovative practice that is embedded in our class or in our cur curriculum? So the question is about uh, asking for per parents' permission uh, when teachers are testing a practice as a, as a research practice, actually. Yeah, I think it's always important to be as ethical as we can, you know, especially if we're going to be collecting data. So, yeah, I, I would I would I would always err on the side of caution and to be as careful as we can and to ensure that we meet as many ethical um, expectations as we can and set the bar very high for ourselves. Yeah, especially if we if we plan to publish the results of our research. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah. OK, then I think that's it for today. Um, many thanks to all the participants who joined and they spent this uh, one hour with us. It was lovely to have you um, on board in this live webinar. Many thanks, Marine, for the very interesting presentation. Always a pleasure to, to work together. And uh, I wish you a nice evening. And uh, yeah, keep on researching to improve practices and keep on learning and developing professionally. OK. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your input. Sorry for falling off the internet a couple of times. Um, and hopefully I'll meet up with you again sometime. Take care.